Jeremy, thank you very much for, for joining me. It's a real pleasure to have you with us. Um, as I just mentioned, I want to start with some of the, the, the broader macro points. And, and when you see people make the, the argument that just simply because of where we are in the current market expansion, a decade on from the low, that that should mean we're due a pullback, well, what do you say to that thought process? I was really hoping there'd be a magnificent bubble ending to this, as there had been to the three great recent experiences, which were the housing bust, 2000 tech bust, and Japan. Mm -hmm. They were all classic. They ended with euphoria and, and a rapidly accelerating stock market. They're easy. You know they'll be followed by an abject decline. This one, I was hoping that would happen, doesn't look like it will and therefore you're going to have a decline of a different nature. Mm -hmm. I wrote a paper three years ago called Not With A Bang But A Whimper, mm -hmm. in which I suggested that this, the trend line PE that used to be 15 and has jumped for 20 years to 20 or 21, which is a, a lot higher, uh, is probably not going to go back the way the value managers would love it to mm -hmm. in a hurry. It may move back slowly and steadily, and I think it will move back perhaps two-thirds of the way, but it will take 20 years, not the usual five, six, or seven years. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this will be limping along, three steps down, two steps back. It's not a typical experience, but it, it looks increasingly likely to me. And when we see that the Fed has pivoted and, and uh, become, relatively speaking, more easy once again, and the ECB has done that, uh, to today. Does yes. that make you think that U.S. equities are attractive for the next couple of years again? <laughs> no, I, I'm afraid not. The, you can't get blood out of a stone there at these prices. Even the, the bears, the bulls, and everyone in between at GMO agree that over a long horizon, like 20 years, U.S. market will be delivering 2 or 3 percent real. Mm -hmm. And for the last 100 years, we're used to it delivering uh, perhaps 6% real. So this is a fairly painful, it's not the end of the world, but it's going to break a lot of hearts uh, when we're right. 3% mm -hmm. a year is going to seem terribly disappointing. Now, if you stay away from the US, which I absolutely would, uh, in emerging markets, I suspect you can do even better than 6, maybe 7 or 8 if you tilt it towards value. Mm -hmm. and, and we'll come to emerging markets in a moment. Just back to the US, so that's your sort of 20-year forecast. Yes. Your, your five or six-year forecast is for, for actual declines in US equities, is that right? I, I would think uh, declines are more likely than the other, and if the market is up, it's highly unlikely to be up a lot. And I think that's the key thought. And, and the main reason, what, va valuations of those stocks? Valuations and the fact that the economic cycle will clearly not be in our favor. The reason we've done so well for 10 years is we had an enormous pool of unemployed. Uh, this is not trend line growth. This is taking 1% a year almost out of the unemployed pool and sticking it into the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And that has boosted our apparent growth rate by almost a point a year. This economy does not have a trend line growth of 2.8 or 2.5. It has a trend line growth of about 1.5. And we've been boosting it on a cyclical basis. And people, if you keep anything up for 10 years in the stock market, people think it's a trend line, but it mm -hmm. isn't. And so on that topic of the economy rather than the markets in, in the U.S., uh, do you fear a recession? Are there any signs you see that suggest one is in, in, uh, on the horizon in the next year or so? I think uh, people have been worried about recessions for two or three years. I've taken the view that there was enough labor hiding in the participation rate. Mm -hmm. We had frightened people away out of the workforce, but on, on, the, on the numbers, they were there lurking around somewhere. And in the last two or three years, we have quite effectively drawn back about one and a half percent. People who were dismayed and weren't bothering now have registered and, and, and show up in the employed or the unemployed. And uh, that game may still have a point and a half left. And a point and a half could keep us going for another couple of years, mm -hmm. or it could stop tomorrow. But the point is, what we cannot do is we cannot grow at the speed we've grown for the last 10 years, mm -hmm. because the labor pool is simply not available, and, and the underlying productivity has not been there for a long time. And what about the global growth outlook? Clearly fears about that had surfaced in the second half of last year. Do you feel like they're adequately priced in now, or, or is well, there... One of my problems is I, I always like to think longer term, apparently, than anybody else, but 
uh, which and, can and be it inc- served you very well, Jeremy. which can be inconvenient, but the growth rate of the population of the developed world is, is has gone to hell, and, and and the population eventually will start to decline in the next couple of decades everywhere in the developed world. Uh, you need 2.1 percent fertility rate to replace and. The U.S. just announced 1.76, 15% below that. It's below in every developed country. This really has an effect on, on the top-line numbers, mm-hmm. and there's no way around that. It's not going to change ever, I, I would guess. So we have uh, lower workforce growth. We have an aging population, which doesn't help, and the growth rate of the, of the whole developed world is settling down, uh, maybe one and a half in the U.S., maybe one in Europe, uh, much lower than people seem to get their brain around. And outside Europe, I think the population growth is, I am certain the population growth rate is also slowing. And uh, so generally speaking, we can look at a world where the secular growth is getting slower. Mm-hmm. That's the long-term picture. Over the next two or three years, uh, I suppose the honest statement is your guess is as good as mine. Fair enough. And, and on, let's dive into Europe a, a little bit more. As, as we were discussing, the ECB has downgraded its growth forecasts uh, from 1.7 to 1.1 percent. Is there a bigger problem bubbling under the surface there? Could they face another existential crisis like they did in 2010 to 12 uh, anytime soon? The downgrading, by the way, is getting awfully close to what I think is their long-term growth rate, mm-hmm. about one. No one else believes that, but I'm pretty confident they will eventually. So uh, they're going to have to learn to live with a low growth rate. They have, of course, other problems of immigration, which has been rattling the cage Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, viciously for the last three or four years politically. And that is uh, highly unlikely to go away. Africa is the only place on the planet where the growth rate in population is still uh, uh, prodigious. And uh, the UN says they're going to produce an extra three billion people. Mm-hmm. Um, and the rest of the world will be declining. Uh, now, there won't be three billion extra Africans, but there may well be one, one and a half, or two billion. And there will be immigration waves that make the recent experience look trivial. And that's going to stress out the European politics. And I think that will be the biggest factor. And as they get stressed out, it, it produces opportunities for the big players, Russia, or China to misbehave or behave, mm-hmm. but, it, but it increases uncertainty. Uh, on the topic of Brexit, soon <laughs> after uh, the 2016 referendum result, you wrote in, a, in an op-ed or a comment piece that you thought there was a roughly one in three chance uh, that the UK might end up turning over its decision somehow or some way. What, what would you say the chances of that Isn't today? that amazing that that one in three has kind of seemed about one in three right up until today. I mean, how is that possible? Why haven't they made it one or zero by now? Mm -hmm. It's um, every day seems to be a replay of the day before. It's um, Groundhog Day, writ large, Mm -hmm. Brexit. But I would guess, yes, it's a one in three chance that they'll have a revote and change their mind. And and I wish it were a two in three. And and the the uh, we were just talking about this. You're in fact going back to London and, and will likely be there for the 29th of March. Do do you think that it gets delayed either way? Is the chance of that higher even still? I'm not an expert at this, so you you tell me, but Mm -hmm. to a layman it looks highly likely two in three that it will be delayed. Mm -hmm. And and maybe then, when it is delayed, the odds of a re-vote and a change of mind might rise a little bit from the one in three. Let's uh, switch to something that I know you're optimistic about, and and that is emerging markets. Uh, your, Your view we talked about that your expectation of a U.S. equity market decline over the next uh, five years. What about for emerging markets? Yeah, I think emerging markets uh, is the future. They have um, the people and uh, faster growth, and uh, increasingly uh, they direct their efforts in a very intelligent way. China, in particular, has is cranking out their percentage of people taking engineering and hard science. So they're now, in total, a much bigger country, but in total, massively outproducing the U.S. in the number of engineers and scientists. Mm-hmm. And as that goes on, it makes it difficult for them not to take the lead in, in one area after another in science. And they are dedicating their resources to artificial intelligence. They've already dominated the, uh, the uh, green energy, wind mm-hmm. and solar. Um, in terms of manufacturing and installation. 
So uh, they're becoming formidable competition. And India too, the fastest growing country in the world that's now taking up the mantle of China. Mm -hmm. The developed world with its miserable growth rates has to, has to compare with India growing at over 6% a year. And on the topic of, of China, given those huge leaps, as you mentioned, it's made in, in science and innovation, is it now inevitable that it will one day be bigger than the U.S. economy? Or yes, not? completely inevitable. But what I should add about emerging is, in the end, after all these conversations, it always comes down to price. And they are much, they're always on average, on average, they're a bit cheaper. They are much cheaper than normal. Mm -hmm. And their currencies are also cheaper than normal. I'm, I'm a great believer in the crude economist uh, uh, judge of, of inflation, uh, the Big Mac index, as mm -hmm. comparing quite effectively. It was a joke to start with, but 40 years later, it has 40 years of data and 60, 80 countries. And I think it's a pretty decent general idea of inflation and, and the currency comparative value. And we have very fancy currency comparisons in our firm and a thousand other firms too. But I wouldn't hold my breath. I think, I think the Big Mac index, the cost of buying mm -hmm. a Big Mac and, and French fries in all the countries of the world, I wouldn't bet against that right. beating it. And what that says is it's always been 25% 20, cheaper to buy a Big Mac in an emerging country, but now it's half price. Mm -hmm. And that movement back from 50 cents to 75% is, is a 50% move. Um, you, you, you mentioned uh, that it's inevitable you think that the Chinese economy will be bigger than the U.S. one day. What therefore one do One day in the very near future. How, how soon? It's a matter of a handful of years. Depends and, what you're measuring and how you measure it. And, and so what therefore do you think is the motivation for the current U.S. trade war with China and will it be successful? Uh, I have to take the Fifth Amendment on this or something like that. It, it's, it's impossible to anticipate, um, to guess what the motives are of the current administration, which is what you're asking. Well, what would the effectiveness I the be then? Idea. It, won't, it won't derail Chinese growth. It won't alter the balance of power, which is in may, a handful of it years. It may supremely China. irritate them and dislocate a quarter or two. In the long term, of course, this will all be forgotten mm -hmm. and it's insignificant. That's the good news. Um, I'm interested that you're quite so bullish on China in this way because uh, you were mentioning how important you think demographics are. Uh, and China's demographics aren't now as attractive as somewhere like India's. Is that a concern for you? Well, it depends what you mean by a concern. I, I, have, I consider a, a slowing growth in population our last best hope. I think if you want to have a, end up as a sustainable world where you protect what's left of your biodiversity, mm -hmm. you can't march irresistibly into the future with a growing population, each of us eating more and, and, and using up more plastic toys. Mm -hmm. It simply does not compute. And uh, so I, I welcome declining populations and India too will be declining in, in 50 years. Let's talk about that, why you're saying that, and it's because you're so passionate about climate change and the environment. If there was, there are a lot of unbelievers out there on this topic today, more so than perhaps there was a, a, a decade ago. If there's one statistic or, or story you point to uh, to convince people of, of their wrong position on that topic, what is it? Well, first of all, uh, there aren't more today. The last, since the election of Trump, and particularly the last half of last year, there's been a big move in the recognition of the problem mm -hmm. uh, in, in the US. So that's a huge change. It's like a log jam that's broken. Plenty of hard-hitting reports, finally the scientists are saying what they actually believe and, and the recognition of all of the fires and the terrible change in the weather and, and, and the climate and uh, people are picking that up. It's now 73% of Americans, up from 63 in a few years, recognize that the climate is an important issue and that it's warming mm -hmm. and that it's dangerous. And, and how do you affect real change? I know that you've donated over 90% of your wealth to the Grantham Foundation for the Protection of the Environment. GMOs also launched a, a climate change fund. To affect real change, does there need to be innovation that ultimately is also profitable in the long term rather than just goodwill? Yes, I don't think goodwill will get this done, sadly. Homo sapiens is not rising to the occasion mm -hmm. and, and maybe never would have done long-term issues are not what we do that well. So we need 
innovation. Luckily, there is a massive amount of innovation that bears directly on climate change, on green energy, on battery storage, electric cars, electric planes in the not too distant future. And, and we will be able to, uh, to change for the better almost every area, cement, steel, uh, petrochemicals. Uh, the question is only can we do it fast enough to prevent damage and the mm -hmm. answer is no. We've already got a lot of damage. We will undoubtedly have a lot more damage. The question is can we protect enough of our agreeable planet to, uh, for our grandchildren to have a decent life? And that, I think, is about a 50-50 bet seen through my eyes. And, and do you f feel like enough industries uh, are doing all that they can when you see the financial industry moving no towards... No industry is doing all it can. No, nobody. I just took a damn plane to Chile. And I have a guilty conscience, and I'm struggling with my wife as to whether we can take that many more <laughs> jet flights. I mean, yes, we plant forests all over the place, but still, um, it's, it's a really tough ask of human beings mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to be uh, as green as they could and should be. So what is the one thing that, that everyone could be doing more? Is it, is it donating some more of their... You've got to have money? government. Uh, this is a big scale, big problem. You've got to have R&D, you've got to have government. The best thing that we can do as individuals is lobby our politicians mm -hmm. to be more sensible. Let them be aware that the weight of our concern. And that's happening, particularly in Europe uh, with that wonderful young uh, Swedish uh, girl. Um, but people are responding mm -hmm. more now than they were. And that's what we have to do. We have to get our uh, our senators and our co congressmen and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, lobby them in the hallways. You, uh, you, uh, you mentioned you took a flight and you felt guilty about that. You, you drive a Tesla though, so you don't need to feel guilty no, when you're in the no, car. No, not very guilty. Uh, do, you, do you like Tesla stock or is it... A, is it no, a I, I have nothing to do with Tesla stock and never did. Uh, it's an extreme demonstration of growth and I'm not saying it won't do well. There are stocks like Amazon that are always growth stocks and have done splendidly well but I'm a value specialist, so it's mm -hmm. not my kind of stock, but it is my kind of car. It's, it's uh, extremely entertaining to drive. Um, just to round off on, on the climate change uh, issue, you, you mentioned you felt there'd been big progress in the US in terms of people's uh, understanding and backing uh, of the yes. cause. What do you think specifically about the, the latest development in the, the Green New Deal? Uh, and do you fear that there is now a, a left versus right politicization of an issue that you believe is apolitical? There's certainly been a left-right division in the US for the last 15 years, which is really sad because most of the good environmental work was done by, by uh, Republican presidents like Teddy and Roosevelt and so on. And uh, it, it's a, a real shame that that has happened and unnecessary because conserving a, a, a beautiful planet would seem to be pretty conservative. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it hasn't played out that way for complicated and perhaps random reasons. Um, and I've forgotten the rest of the question. <laughs> As in, has it become too political to an, to an extent that it will damage the cause? The, the, new, um, the new proposals are, are, too, um, are too extreme to expect it to actually translate into any chance of implementation. Mm -hmm. However, when you have been drifting to the right for 50 years, it needs a good slap in the face to wake people up and begin the pendulum move back. And uh, one way to state it is to take a big jump. So this is really drawing attention to the fact that we've had a remarkable drift. Mm -hmm. we, we, we end up in a world where the Environmental Protection Agency is run by coal lobbyists. I mean, it's. Ten years ago, you couldn't have written a novel where things like that would have mm -hmm. happened. It's so intrinsically unbelievable, horrific. Um, some other progressive uh, policies uh, and announcements of, of recent weeks have seen, in different forms, a call for, for more taxes to be paid by the wealthy. Where do you stand on that? Do you think that that, that is, uh, is something that should be done, even if the exact mechanics of it are uncertain? Well, I arrived in 1964 and America was a fairly equal place with fairly uh, rapid mobility between socio-economic classes. And it's basically since 1975 gotten stickier and now it's worse than the UK. I mean, who would have imagined that in 1964? Mm -hmm. And we have one of the mo most unequal 
countries in the developed world. We're not far short of the Brazils and Chiles uh, and closing the gap. So we have a dreadfully unequal society where the average worker for an average hour's work has not made much increase in real income since the mid-1970s, for heaven's sake. Mm -hmm. And if you don't give the average worker a decent wage, where is your growth going to come from? This is, you know, you could quote Henry Ford. Mm -hmm. How are they going to buy my cars unless I pay them a decent wage? Well, we're falling foul of that. So if you need to distribute the income more evenly. And, and the concentration of income and wealth in particular in the top 0.01 and 0.1 and 1% mm -hmm. has just alarmingly increased. It is uh, amazingly uh, economically ineffective. Rich people don't spend their marginal dollars. Poor mm -hmm. people spend them instantly. You get a healthier economy if more of the pool goes to the, to the poor than does today. So yes, you have to tax the better off, particularly the super rich. Um, one of the other philanthropic areas you're passionate about is, is a sort of truth issue, journalism and communication, uh, and you've donated in, in that direction as well. How, how worrying to you is the trend of, of misinformation uh, or fake news, whatever you want to call it? Is, is that as, as big a crisis uh, as, the, as the environmental one in your mind at the moment? No, uh, I think the environmental one transcends uh, everything, but, but I got it to be an environmentalist the hard way by looking at the data and having it beat me on the head. I spent most of my life in, in America, I'm a Brit, but I, I spent 30 years notionally as a, uh, a kind of uh, centrist, mm -hmm. uh, the old liberal uh, Republicans that went out of business long ago. And uh, I'd vote for anybody with a green policy, mm -hmm. but the data has become so extreme that just looking at the data, has dragged me uh, into tax the rich, move the income in a more efficient way uh, so that uh, the poor people have money to spend mm -hmm. for a healthy economy, and uh, for heaven's sake, tax carbon so that we can start the entrepreneurs working on changes. They're all itching, but they have no resources, mm -hmm. and no one will fund them because it's not clear how they're going to make money. But once you have a tax on carbon, and a credit for saving carbon, the ingenuity that will spring out of the American venture capital industry will be prodigious. Mm -hmm. American capitalism, I think, is in a rather bad spot. It's a bit lethargic and monopolistic and unentrepreneurial un compared to the old days. But the great exception is venture capital. American venture capital is vigorous. It, it dominates the planet along with Israel, uh, oddly. Mm -hmm. But um, there's a lot, of, a lot of hope if you can release the entrepreneurial and, and inventive spirit, uh, and, and a carbon tax would do that. To uh, bring it back to the macro and the markets, Jeremy, as we, as we round things off, is there one emerging market that, that stands out ahead of the rest for you on a five to ten year view? Um, I, 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 don't, I really don't do that, but obviously India has the fast growth and is a fairly stable society, mm -hmm. so if you take a long 10, 20 year view, it's easy to imagine that will be hard to beat and, and very few uh, developed countries would do that. How China will play out, it's always hard to say. Uh, they have many advantages um, and, and they can address, redirect capital in an area where they want to, mm -hmm. but with the slowing population, their GDP growth will perhaps uh, start to tail off. And, and who knows what will happen with their kind of government, I don't. And, and uh, a final question on the U.S. We've, we've gone through your, your outlook of U.S. Uh, equities. Even where you see value, as a value investor, the most famed value investor, do you still think that those value stocks within the S&P 500 will also underperform in the next five years? I think they'll do uh, less badly, but they're not cheap enough to do well. And you have to be very careful these days with what you mean by value. The old crude measures of value that used to work pre the year 2000 uh, won't necessarily work. There are too many programmed into the computer models uh, and what edge they used to have, which was decent, has probably gone away. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very careful how you, you have to have a broad and, and complicated and accurate measure of value. And that, that's not easily done. It used to be you showed up for work, you bought the high yields and the low PEs mm -hmm. and you won. Life was good. 
and now, now you can't do that. Jeremy, it's been a real pleasure sitting down with you today. Uh, a, Same for me. A, a treat for us, uh, a treat for our viewers. Thank you very much. Thank you.